Apprehend God in all things, for God is in all things. Every single creature is filled with God and is a book about God. Amen. Okay, so you have to look up here. Show of hands, who remembers eighth grade? How was that year for you? <laughs> that was a tough year for me. Yeah, yeah, it was a tough. Uh, actually, uh, you know, it was pretty good in some areas, and in other areas it was not so good. And one area was this one classroom. Um, now, in eighth grade, I, you know, I was like an eight, lots of eighth graders. So I got into some trouble. <laughs> yeah, imagine that. <laughs> And uh, um, so at one point in, in, during the year, I decided I was going to start wearing this cross. And I'm pretty sure I got the cross for my sixth grade confirmation. You know, it's kind of like a symbol for turning over a new leaf. So I would wear it inside my shirt. You know, because eighth grade and all. That's crazy to wear it outside your shirt. <laughs> so I wore it inside my shirt. But one day, somehow or another, it got outside. And I was in this class with this teacher who, um, let's just say, we did not have a really great relationship. Okay? So I was standing there, and she walks up. I was talking to somebody, and she walks up, and she, she didn't grab my cross, but she took it in her hand. And she had it in her hand, like in her palm. I, I mean, I still remember this. And she's looking at it, and she looks at me. And then she looks at it, and she looks at me. And then she goes, you shouldn't be wearing this. <laughs> yeah, I know. I was like, what's up with that? And, and you know, it just immediately sent me on the defensive. I mean, what? she doesn't think I'm good enough to wear one of these things. What is up with her? She's probably right. But what was up with her? How dare she say that? And then I noticed that she went back up to the desk that she had a cross on, and so I started thinking, well, you don't deserve to wear that either. You're, you're the wicked witch of the West. And on and on and on. So right there, there's an example. There's a scene of two of the five foolish bridesmaids. That's what it looks like. Okay? Just briefly, we'll look at the story, and maybe you can see what I'm talking about. So we got five foolish, five wide, wise bridesmaids, and they're getting ready to meet the groom. And who's the groom? Jesus, Christ, the Christ. I always say Jesus in church. Just say, uh, uh. But the groom is the Christ. Okay? So they're getting ready to meet the Christ. The five foolish are not ready to meet the Christ, and they don't. The five wise, they are. They're open, they're prepared, they're ready, and they're willing and they do meet the Christ. They see the Christ and they enter into the banquet, the kingdom of heaven. See, the tragedy of my relationship with the teacher is that neither of us could see the Christ in one another. You see, meeting the Christ, seeing the Christ is a huge deal in the Christian tradition. And for some parts of our tradition, they say the only time we're going to meet Christ is at the very end, way off into the future, and it's going to be this big deal, but it's always in the future, always way out, and maybe that's so, maybe that's true, but the brilliance of our tradition, our part, the Anglican part of the Christian tradition, was to say, okay, so there will be a future meeting, but there's also the meeting of Christ that takes place every day. You see, our tradition would say we can meet the Christ in the very next person we meet. When our eyes are opened and we're ready and we're willing. And once again, the tragedy of my relationship with the teacher was we couldn't do that. Now, the positive is, there are people who live like this. There are people who live 
ready, open, open and willing to see the presence of Christ in themselves and in the next person they meet. One of them is this guy named Father Gregory Boyle. And he wrote this book, Tattoos on the Heart. John mentioned him two weeks ago, and I'm just absolutely captured by this guy. Because in this book is story after story after story of him meeting the Christ in people and in places where most of us would not. Where I would not, probably. One of the... um, Thing, just to remind you, one of the things that Father Greg Boyle does is he, he's a Jesuit priest and he went to work in the, in the poorest part of East L.A., poorest, roughest part of East L.A., in the poorest parish in that rough neighborhood. And after living there for a few years, he and some others started what's known as Homeboy Industries. And homeboy Industries is a, a, a place where people can get jobs or job placements if they are trying to get out of their gang. So people who want to get out of the gang, their gangs can go to Homeboy Industries to get a job or job placement. But it's a huge requirement that if they fall back into gang life, they can't work there anymore. So such was um, the, the, what happened to Jason. Jason was one of the guys from Homeboy Industries, and he'd worked there for a while. And he started getting back into the, um, the gang life. And Father Greg heard about it. And so Father Greg called him into his office, and he said this. He said, Jason, mijo, now mijo is a, like a term of endearment. Jason, mijo, let me tell you where I am with you. He said, I know that you are the light of the world. I know that you are the image of God, but you don't know that yet. He said, what I want you to know is that I am always with you. I'm always in your corner. I will be with you until the wheels come off, which is a prison saying for forever. He said, but... You cannot work here and be in a gang. You see, seeing Christ in ourselves and seeing Christ in others does not mean that we're perfect or that anybody else is perfect. And it doesn't mean that there are no consequences to our lives. There are. This is what Father Greg says about Jason. He says, Jason is who he is. He makes a lot of mistakes. He is not perfect, and his rage calls the shots for much of his life. And he is the light of the world. And he is the image of God. And the Spirit of Christ lives in him. You see, Father Greg can see Christ in Jason even when Jason can't see Christ in himself. That's the five wise bridesmaids. And someone asked him, um, asked Greg, you know, how did you get to this? How did you get to where you could see people like this and treat people like this? Where did that come from? And Father Greg says, well, I learned it by um, being with other people, and in particular, one person. And his name was Bill. And Father Greg and Bill used to meet and talk. They'd have a cup of coffee. They would chat. They would talk about what's going on in life. And one time, Bill told Greg this story. He said, you know, Greg, there was a time in my life where I had to stop work for a while. I had to stop my work so that I could go home and take care of my father because he was dying of cancer. And he said those days were long. They were long and they were hard because my father's body was deteriorating but his mind was still there. And after long, long days, I, I would, we had this evening ritual and I would put him in bed 
And then I would read to him. He said, I would read to him the same way he read to me when I was a little boy. And he said, the deal was, I was supposed to read and he was supposed to go to sleep. He said, but what would happen was I'd start reading and I'd look up and he'd be staring right at me, smiling. And I was exhausted, so I'd say to him, Dad, you know the deal. I read, you sleep. (laughs) And so he'd shut his eyes, close his eyes, and then he would start reading again, and then he'd see his dad would open one eye. (laughs) And then he would open the other eye and then just start smiling again. And he said, as tiring as as it was, he said that ritual was so important. He said, because in the end, that ritual was the story of a father who just couldn't take his eyes off his kid. And he said, now how much more is that true for God and us? That God delights in delighting in you. God delights in delighting in you. And the fact of the matter is, when we can experience this, then we can share it with others. My friends, the bottom line of this good news today is this. We are the image of God. We are the light of the world. The Spirit of Christ lives in you and in me and all around us. And when we are open and ready and willing to see that presence in ourselves and in our neighbors, we will. And when we do and enter into that, reality, we will experience the kingdom of heaven right here, right now, or wherever else you might be. Now, can I get an amen?